dinner time. Not without the farm, not without water, but our ground, or machines to plow it. Not without safe keeping. Distribution. Top up every now and then. Not without the wholesaler. Retailer. Or the bank that backs the mall. Dinner time. Not without business. Stand it back. It can't be. Welcome to the third of a four-part Standard Bank SME Summit in partnership with Business Day. My name is Pavlo Fatidis, and I hope you managed to take and use what we shared with you in the first and second events. Remember, the first event was about mindset. How do you get your own personal mindset and psychology right when you're facing a world of change, whether it be through COVID or more recently, the rights that we have suffered as a country. Those changes are certain to continue, whether it be through climate change, technology, or ongoing dissent in amongst the have and the have-nots. It's happening globally. The next event was about reset. In a world of change, what does it mean to your customers? How do you need to make changes in order to stay relevant? In light of it being Women's Month. We'd like to thank the women that have kept the cogs turning at home, in life, in business, and in our hearts. Setting the scene today, we're going to talk about Rebuild. There it is. It's why I'm wearing the hat. Because as business owners, businesses don't just appear. They are built through our head, our heart, and our hands. The last event that will follow on from today will all be about reigniting your reset business that has been rebuilt in order for you to race ahead of your competitors and get well beyond your own expectations. I see we have a number of people joining us. It didn't mess my hair, did it? I hope not. Shenyi Madani, Director at Marketing Decisions. I notice that you provide demographic data for South Africa and specifically in the retail transport aviation sectors. Sean Diab from PVC Pipefit and Engineering. Sean, I'm fascinated about on-site pipe manufacture because if you don't do it that way, you're typically transporting air. I'd love to learn more about that business and what you do. Winnie Matebula from Why Give Poultry Farm. Winnie, a question to you. Why give, is that a message to the chicken? Because I hope you're charging for your produce. And then Nicholas Yoryu from Revolution Synthetic Oil in the lubrication industry. Nicholas, today we're gonna to be talking about the moving parts of a business. How do you lubricate them and get them moving to ensure that your business grows? and Jabu Shungube from Woodtech Concepts, who designs and manufactures bespoke furniture in the residential commercial spaces. Jabu, I hope you got a lot of business during the COVID lockdown periods, when all of a sudden we all had to work at home. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got access to the live chat section next to the streaming page. Think about the questions you'd like to have answered today. Think about the biggest opportunities you want to make happen and put them forward to us. Challenge us today to give you the right answers in order to help you get to your next level. We're going to be answering all the questions that come through. We'll try and answer some of them during this event. And if not, we'll answer them in the subsequent event or through the email that everybody will be getting afterwards. Since we're talking about building a business, I want to build and leave you with a clear demonstration of how we get this done. How do we turn 
the ideas and the insights into a practical model of what you need to get done in your business. And to help me with this, I have Joe Kirsten, a Lego ambassador who owns an enormous number of Lego pieces to build it out. Joe, a quick question to you. Yes, Pablo. How many Lego pieces do you have? Um, first, I need to ask if you are 100% sure that my wife is not watching because it's a <laughs> lot. It's close to a million pieces, Pablo. A million pieces. That's correct. How big is your house, Joe? My house is just big enough for a room for all of us and a spare bedroom for my Lego room. And the living room and the kitchen and the bathrooms and the lounge and TV room, <laughs> all made of Lego? Or Unfortunately not. And Lego is banned from the kitchen and the bedroom and the lounge. There we go. So with my builder on hand, Joe, we now need the practical wisdom to build the business that we have reset to thrive in a crisis and in change. But here's the thing, the word wisdom, what does it mean? Wisdom's got two elements to it. It talks to insight, and insight only comes from direct experience. And it turns to foresight, and foresight also comes from direct experience. So to get it all done, I have an all-female panel joining us today. They are business investors, they are business owners, and they are some of the deepest investors in the South African economy like yourselves. They have done it, they continue to do it, and they have traveled the road so that they can talk to us using head, heart, and hands. My first guest is Sunshine Klamalani from Shibam Shibambo, owner of Cherry Yase Kasi. Second, joining with me is Saskia Hill, CEO and owner of MCS Debt Recovery and Connect BPS. From Cape Town, Naima Abrams, Group Managing Director of Freightmore. And from Cape Town, a person we will love to hate, Robin Zinman, CEO of OptiSmile Advanced Dentistry. Love to hate, we need them, but boy, we don't like visiting dentists. There's a lot of ground to cover. So let's get started. I'm going to start with you, Saskia. Tell us, in a nutshell, what you do. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, we are in the global um, business process outsourcing sector. Um, we've got a contact center. Um, our one business, MCS Debt Recovery, primarily focuses on debt collection in South Africa. And Connect BPS is our, where we host our offshore clients. And there we do any outsource function, debt collection, um, sales, quality assurance, reading recruitment um, for both the UK and the US. How many dials have you made? Because my understanding about the call center business, it's about having a bunch of people in a busy room, all connected through phone and Wi-Fi to customers right around the world. And you're either selling something or you're looking to recover some money, but it's engagement with the clients of big insurers or big retailers and the like. It must mean that you phone a lot. How many phone calls have you made since inception? If I guess around 500 million over 26 years. 500 million telephone calls in the days before Wi-Fi. <laughs> Telcom must have loved you. <laughs> yes, um, no, they did. And also with change now as well, we're moving a lot to WhatsApp. Excellent, um, good. The dials. Sunshine. <laughs> Hello. It comes across. Your name is so suited to your character and personality. Thank you. In a nutshell, what do you do? I would say that we are a communication solution business. Um, our business is called Chirasekasi, and you said that so well. A lot of people struggle to say it. And what it means is go from the hood. We help our clients find the best communication solutions and use creativity and ideation to solve it. So, so in simple terms, if I'm a client and I want to sell um, something to my customers, we I need will. to tell you who my customers are, and then Absolutely. you figure out how, how to get my message to, 
those customers? Absolutely. We will show our clients how to talk to them, whether it's in the language, it's understanding who the customer is, where they're based. So what we help them do is create a personality, essentially, that they can use to communicate with their customer so that the customer feels like the brand or the client understands them. You use social media. Absolutely. How many Instagram posts have you posted <laughs> since you started your business? Well, since Instagram started at, say, 6,000, um, through the business, it depends. There are busy periods when nothing comes out. But I got my first client using social media. So I try to be as consistent as possible. Um, I find that people who follow me on those pages are cheering me on on the sides. They want to invest in our business, they want to see us grow. So we get a lot of referrals from social media. Excellent. Some of my favorite clients actually come from social media. Excellent. Robin, you're in Cape Town. And I'm so sorry, but when I said love to hate, it's because <laughs> honestly, I've had to suffer some horrible dental treatment. In a nutshell, what do you do to make that better? Well, basically, um, we specialize in, well, we're a destination, a specialty destination for oral health, but really for smile rejuvenation and complete uh, restoration. So we provide world-class dentistry and we try and attract people um, to our business uh, in a way where we show them that it's not a grudge purchase, that it's not about pain, it's about minimal invasive um, dentistry and um, in an environment where it's very pleasant and you have an experience rather than, you know, sit in a dental chair and experience pain all the time. So I have a question for you. Was Joe Biden your customer? Because how old is this guy? He's 78. And every time I see him smile, there's this flash of white across his mouth. Do you do that kind of work? Yes, that's exactly what we do. We put smiles on people's faces. That's the aim of the game for us. So whether they've got pain, whether they've got yellow crooked teeth, whether they have teeth missing or chipped, it's not about the pain. It's not, we, we, we definitely don't um, hurt people it's, at all. And it's about enjoying the process and the journey to smile with Fantastic. confidence. But, uh, without a doubt, and there's no question about that. Naima, in a nutshell, what do you do? So, Pablo, my industry is obviously not as glamorous as the rest of the ladies. We do a road transport, business-to-business -business solution for our clients, where we focus mainly on printing and packaging and brake bulk and automotive industries. So, yeah, it's not as glamorous as smiling and Instagram because it's big vehicles and it's on our South African road. Oh, I love big vehicles. How many wheels do you manage? 26 on the big vehicles and four on my own car. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a great panel today. We're going to make this very, very practical. There's no theory over here. It's only going to be the lived experience from each and every one of my panelists to work with you together to build out the three cogs that make a business work. Our reset business needs to operate. And to make it operate, the first thing we need, the most valuable thing in every business, are customers and clients. And that means they need to learn about us. They need to understand that we exist. In business terms, we talk about that as marketing. In practical terms, we talk about it as leads that we need to generate, getting people knocking on our door, saying, I'm interested to learn more about what it is that you do and how you can be of value to me. Once they knock on your door, the next cog we need to build, the next gear in our business, is how do we engage that client, that prospective client or customer. What journey will we take them through to A, understand how we can be of value to them, and then B, give them a great experience, build up their trust in order for them to say, I want to now have you fulfill my service. And then the last cog is that once that deal is done, how do you deliver that service? 
And how do you meet the expectations that you've created in your customer's mind in the marketing process and in the sales process so that they are happy, B, you get paid, and C, they tell the world about you. Three cogs, essential in every and any business, despite the industry you're in and irrespective of your size. I'm going to start with you, Saskia, immediately. Call center services on an outsourced basis means you're serving what kind of clients? What kind of clients do you look to attract? Um, you know, Pablo, anyone who, who, who is interested in outsourcing their, their, their services. So in the US, we've, we've actually done recruitment for the vaccine campaign um, to, to help Biden you know, get everyone vaccinated. We've got debt collectors, um, retail, retailers we do sales for. Um, so it's, it's anyone, if so from a US, UK, overseas perspective, it's anyone who would like to take advantage of the cost arbitrage. Okay, that's really interesting. So you can speak to wide audiences because you develop a script, you've got the call center capability, but when you market your business in order to bring new clients on board, what marketing message are you sending to who and how do you then send that message? Um, our message is, you know, A, it's the cost arbitrage mm -hmm. to, to move the work to South Africa, that it's professional and reliable and that we're trustworthy. Um, and that's all built up over time. I mean, we've made our mistakes. Um, What's the biggest mistake you've made <laughs> in marketing? <laughs> um, putting me on the spot, yeah? <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, we've, we've made a couple of, of, of errors and perhaps I think is that one of my mistakes that I, I, I wish I'd learned much earlier on in, in business is that I try to do too much. I try to do every single cog of the wheel. Um, and it took me a good few years to realize that once I brought on a senior team, my life changed. Okay, but let me understand something specifically about marketing. Now, the way that you would communicate your value to the insurance industry, it's very different to the way you would communicate your value to the pharma care, healthcare industry. So when you target who you want to send the message to, do you organize it against industries or do you organize it against the problems you can solve through the service you provide? It's more of a global, the problems that we can solve for them. Um, so it's not, we, we obviously read up about the industry um, so, so that before we have the conversation with them, we've got an idea of that industry, but it's a global outsource service that we can solve for them. And then how do you get the message to them? Are you using email? Are you using which platforms, which communication channels are you using? So that's also evolved through COVID. Um, so previously, um, I prefer, always prefer the face-to-face, -face, attending the conferences overseas, um, having a meeting with them. And we've evolved uh, because now there's no on-site visits. Um, it's more so through virtual reality. Um, we've made a really nice video showing you know, a whole drive through uh, from the beach, how far we are into our offices, the access controls. Okay, that's really interesting. Sunshine, I think that makes for a very interesting point because in effect, what Saskia has done, if you think about it, how do you, how do you create a physical idea of what your service is if you're not selling a physical product? Absolutely. And making a video, certainly works. You would have experienced that in your agency. 100%. I think making a video is absolutely, especially after what happened in Durban, I think making a video was the best solution to comfort her clients that were still here, but to also sell her service. Um, the joy of COVID, I think, for everyone is that we had to find ways to communicate different, whether through to our customers or to our clients. And what it did is it use digital and especially, I mean, we sit on platforms like this now to communicate with people at home because we can't gather. What digital did for us is made us create new and unique ways to communicate. And I say that in a sense that if you sell socks, right? Traditionally, you would face to face it. This is my sock business this is what I'm selling, but there's 200 other sock suppliers. So you create a video instead and you get old people to wear your socks and they're dancing to a Madonna song. <laughs> That's a different way of communicating. You're saying my socks are different. Okay, so what you're saying then is when you market your message 
when you take your message out into the market, you've got to make it visual, Absolutely. ideally. Absolutely. You've got to make it engaging and entertaining. And then you've got to pick the right platform to get it out there. Yeah. Now, I have a big debate around this in my mind because <laughs> I think digital is dead. Never. And the reason I think it's dead is because unless you have a physical product that has a deal for the consumer, the last time I clicked on a digital advert must have been when they first came out. <laughs> How do you get me to click on an advert? What would you need to do to get me to click on an advert? To get your attention. I maybe use a cat. <laughs> <laughs> cat but videos yeah. are the rage. <laughs> everyone has a cat video. I, I think it's different for everyone. What is what is definitely true about everyone is human beings are visual people, right? That's why we buy the clothes we do, the cars we do, the food we do. You you see something and you make that decision based on what I see. So it is important to know if I'm speaking to a slightly older white gentleman, what are the things that are in your little bubble? whether it's car racing, maybe you enjoy cooking, maybe you enjoy golf. Spot on. And that's what we discussed in the Reset event. Absolutely. We said that when you market, what's vital to get it right is it's not about the product or the service. It's about the lived reality of the individual, Absolutely. whether they be in a business that you're selling to or a consumer themselves that you need to understand. And when you try and be all things to all people, mm. it's impossible to understand that, which makes the marketing engagement very, very difficult. Robin, surely your business is an easy business to market. Well, um, you would think so. You would think that, you know, your every custom, every person out there is your customer because everybody's got teeth. But as you said, you can't be everything to everyone and you need to narrow it down. So in actual fact, Pablo, we, we only have six customers at OptiSmile. So we have three men and three women. And so, for example, I mean, we haven't got time for me to explain all of them, but, you know, you've been to Seattle Coffee Bar or to, um, you know, uh, here in Cape Town, we've got bootleggers. And when you're there drinking coffee and you look around and you see people on their laptops, you know, writing code, producing some digital amazing something or writing, you know, their thesis. They all have one thing in common. Um, they hate their selfie, basically. So it's a difference between taking a selfie picture like this or a selfie picture like this <laughs> with a big smile and confidence. And so that's who we market to in the one, you know, one of our customer types. Okay, that, that becomes very interesting because in truth, you've just made a very important point. It's not about what you do. It's not about the dental equipment you've got. It's not about the tools. It's not about your skills. When a business engages with its potential clients, it's about the client. It's about oh, the client. And to the extent that you understand that you've got a group of clients that hang out in Seattle or bootlegger coffee shops, it allows you to now find a way to reach them. And that might be through a card, it might be through uh, a free cup of coffee or whatever the process may be. But now you know where birds of a feather would gather together so you can create an engagement process to get those clients aware of what it is that you have to offer. Give us an example of another group that you market to? Well, you know, another group would, you know, the, the, the usual type of marketing as we talk about on, on social media and everything, but we've got another group of customers. Um, I like to call them Henry and Rosemary Platinum, okay? So those people, they have, you know, teeth that have served them all their lives and they've, you know, worn them down or need certain dental work to improve their smile, make them feel younger, and you wouldn't advertise on, on social media. They're not social media type people. And, you know, when you drill down to the persona, you know, and you look at, you know, where they dine, who they uh, surround themselves, what kind of people, where they shop, 
what newspapers, they, their magazines they read, what TV programs they, they look at. You have to really look at your customer and say, if, if, you, if you, I'm in their shoes and I'm not confident with my smile and I don't feel young anymore, where will I look? And for them, it's completely different. For them, it's, it's a glossy pamphlet, a magazine showing, you know, how we would solve their problem for them, how long it's going to take to solve their problem. And, and, and what the cost is, it's not about the financial cost, really. Absolutely right. It's about the time cost. It's about the emotional cost. And, and, and the education behind it. So we would, you know, look at that, that segment of the community completely Excellent. different to who I call the people sitting in the coffee shops, Kevin Silicone and Bongi Masters. I example. love the fact that you've created characters for each of your groups. Naima, how do you market your business to people sitting in the Seattle coffee shops? Or do you? So that's, that has been a very tricky situation for us, Pablo. We <laughs> we do business-to-business -business interaction. And where we found that it's not the Seattle Coffee Company group taking the selfies, it's the, the higher decision makers. And it has been difficult because we traditionally went out and sold what we offer. We said we have this many vehicles. We do this route from year to year. And we didn't listen to what our customer needed because it was all good and well that we have 100 vehicles. So let me guess, let me guess, let me guess. Let me guess. What they said to you in return is, yes, we know other people like you who also have 100 vehicles. Mm -hmm. And that must have been a big wake-up call for you. So what did you do differently now? What we had to do differently is actually listen to our customers' needs. We had to group them because, like you said, you can't be everything to everyone. So we had to look and map what we offer and what solution that solves provides to our customer. So and give us the, give us an example of one of the groups that you market to. How did you how did you define the group, and and how do you engage with that group when you're marketing your service? So we, we market to printing and packaging and to automotive industries. So um, we've had a long-standing relationship with the printing and packaging. And obviously, it has become a, a lesser industry or a dying industry because people are moving digital. So we interact with these industries by word of mouth and also our, our clients know us as being a market leader in these industries in terms of providing transport solutions. Excellent. So, folks, you know, we can see this now. The reset process from the previous event is all about understanding that as human beings, we don't buy products, we don't buy services, we don't even buy price. We buy a solution to a problem that we experience. As a business, we need to understand we can't be everything to everyone. And we need to understand that unless we first connect with the human being behind that customer or client, we will never get their business. It's been demonstrated so clearly over here that you need to decide who you want to serve understand what problem you solve for them, and then most importantly, understand how they want to learn about you in order for your marketing campaign to be built. I want to go to Joe, because Joe, three cogs we are busy building together. What is going to be the first cog that we build? If it's going to be the marketing cog that we can bake into our business to get that cog working, and get our marketing campaigns running. What are the current options you've got for me, Joe, to get that cog operating? Pablo, we talked about the, the marketing now, and we need to be on fire. We need to be out there and to heat up the, the emotional need for the products that we've got going. So I think in terms of marketing being on fire, red is the correct color for the cog that we're gonna put on, on our device. And if I can go ahead and place this on here, there we go. So hang on a sec, Joe. I'm just looking at the device that we've created to represent 
the operating entity of a business, the three cogs, the big yellow propeller, that big yellow propeller, ladies and gentlemen, is like on any ship. When the propeller's not turning, it's not moving. In a business, when the red cog is not turning and you don't have a marketing system in place, you're not getting anyone asking you for custom or service. So let's go ahead. Let's put the red cog on to represent marketing. And then, Joe, switch on the cog. I want to see the propeller turn. So as you said, Pablo, unfortunately, this thing has some play in it, but definitely not enough to create any waves. We've placed the red cog of marketing, and let's switch it on and see what happens. Oh, my word. So the cog of marketing is turning, but nothing's happening. Unfortunately, and the reason not. for it. Say again? Is, the reason for that is it needs to join the next cog. So what I'm going to do is go back to our panel, because what's the next cog that follows after you've got leads and customers knocking on your door? It's going to be sunshine, <laughs> sales. Absolutely. Can you need to engage your customers that are interested in getting service from you. Absolutely. So in your space as an agency, once people become familiar with you and they knock on your door and they say, we'd like to learn more, what is the sales process that you engage with them through in order to convince them that you are the right player to get their issue solved? So a lot of the times we'll actually challenge our client and say, what is the problem? The only way we can find a solution is to get more insights into your problem. We'll poke them about, you know, what have you struggled with before? Give us an example where it's worked, what hasn't worked. And we want to learn from their mistakes to be able to find their solution. So, so you're not going to just immediately say, well, listen, Pablo, I can fix this for you through an Instagram campaign. Absolutely not. Because? Um, because not every solution is a press one, play one, right? We have to find out what makes your cogs move as a business. What is a business that you're hoping to achieve at the end of the day? This is not a once-off. We want to build it for you over time. The power of marketing is being able to let that run. To your point, okay, keep that cog moving. You're saying something far deeper here. You're saying you're changing the dynamic of what a business is. Absolutely. Because isn't a business about making money or is a business about solving a problem for customers? If you can solve your problem for customers, I almost guarantee it you'll make money. Completely agree with you. Because clients or customers want to feel like you can solve their problem. At the end of the day, convenience, ability, you know, are you able to do what you say you can do, is what clients are looking for. That reassurance that you know and understand them. And the only way to do that is to look back. So in a selling system, when you build the sales process, mm -hmm. It. It's really important <laughs> Absolutely. that a customer feels heard, they feel understood, Yes. they feel that they've expressed the problem that they have, they feel that you understand the problem, mm -hmm. you and have... then you begin the sales process of Absolutely. explaining how you can solve it for them. Absolutely. We will help them build their briefs. What we found is a lot of our clients don't actually know how to say, this is my problem. So we'll help them try and find their problems. Because if we have a clear brief, one, we're not going to waste money going around the problem and trying to give you these false solutions. What it does is it means we'll give you a precise, researched, authentic, relevant, and a solution that will create talkability. In our business, we call it art. There we go. Naima, authentic, relatable, got... and talkability. Got it. Very good insights. Naima, you're sitting with a fleet of trucks. You're sitting with a bunch of drivers. When rubber is not burning on the road, you're losing money. And when you engage with an inquiry knocking on your door, it must be really hard to not want to put a truck in between you and your customer to get a problem solved. How do you convert an interested inquiry into a customer? I think it's much like Sunshine said, is that we first ask our customer and try and listen to them to see what their problem is. Can we service their problem? 
that is the most important thing is for a customer to feel that we do understand what they need us to do and for us to understand that we can do what they are asking us to do. So in many ways, what you do in your sales engagement process, because you've got to build a sales team behind this, you teach your team to engage with customers through a series of questions before they provide any solution. Because if I listen to what you've said, it's really important to match the solution to the problem in order to get the customer to become a client and when you then service them to keep them happy, right? That's correct. So our, our salespeople are empowered with what we call a sales filter. This is asking the client about themselves and about their business and then also asking them about what product it is that they want us to move. So it empowers us with the necessary information to see if their business fits in as a cog into our business and we can provide the solution for their business. It is quite difficult because at some point, customers will think that it's providing transport just from A to B, but we might not service a particular area. And there's nothing worse than signing up a customer and not solving their problem and then saying to them, we do not service the solution. Completely. It burns your brand, it burns your reputation, and you've burnt that customer for life. Robin, do you use technology to support the sales process? In other words, can I smile at you today, and then you can help me understand what my smile tomorrow could look like? Absolutely. So, for example, we have what we call this Artero scanner. It's it's brand new we have the first one in south africa and what it does it scans your teeth and it provides you with a simulated outcome within minutes of what your smile potentially could look like once and 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 we educate you how you know how you're going to feel once we have solved your problem so basically they come with a self-identified problem um, we walk we walk them through the process through the digital um, scanning process, which doesn't take a long time, and then they see themselves, what they would look like once they've been through the process at OptiSmile. Are you able to offer that digitally online? In other words, could I smile and take a photograph of my smile and then use your technology to look at the future me before I even meet you? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, well, one of the things we do, and I'm giving away some inside secrets here, is that if you're a new patient at OptiSmile, before you come in, we will first of all have a video consultation with you, but you will upload some photographs ahead of time so that we understand. You will fill in a form, and it's not just about your medical history. It's about, you know, how crooked are your teeth? How yellow are your teeth? What would you, how would you feel if we have solved your problem? So. Um, before we even engage with you, before we meet you face to face, we meet you online and we um, show you what potentially you could look like and how emotionally you will feel and what confidence we can give you from, um, you know, our services. That's so wonderful. A, the, so your selling system is a combination of try before you buy and a before and after experience because… Correct. My knowledge of human behavior is that whilst a picture is worth a thousand words, an experience is worth a thousand pictures. Saskia, 100%. in your business, I knock on the door. There are many people who offer call center services. Mm -hmm. Who am I knocking on your door? And what journey do you take me through to become convinced in your selling system that you are the right provider for me? Um, very similar to what Sunshine and Nahim have said, um, we have a, a project implementation team um, where we meet with our customer and, and their team so that we're all aligned with what they want to achieve, how we're going to achieve it, the deadlines um, to achieve it, and so that we're always closing that, ex that expectation is always met, that there isn't a, that expectation gap. I think with our clients, um, a lot of, especially on the debt collection side with data, um, we're actually an extended arm of their reputation. So we need to be able to show that 
you know, we, we were upholding their, their brand um, and their reputation. Okay, so what I'm hearing again from you, which is now the fourth time in a row, is that selling is not about pushing a product. It's not about pushing a service. You've got to create a sales engagement process that if you understand who your customer is, you can help them understand, unpack, and almost experience what the service experience would be like before they sign a contract to do business with you. Joe, I want to now add to our marketing cog. We've yes. got the red cog turning. We've got deals being, we've got inquiries from customers and clients through our marketing system. We're now engaging with them to convert them from inquiries into customers. What color cog are we going to use and where do we locate it to get the propeller turning? Um, Pablo, I think as we have now laid the groundwork and we've set fire to the marketing team and they've created the emotional connection to our product, it's, we need the green light for our sales team to go out. So we're going to use a green cog on the second. Um, well, let's put it into our system. Let's see what happens when you switch it on. I'm looking for that propeller to turn. So let's see if we're going to get the propeller going on the second one. Oh, oh my word. Listen, what's important now is that the red cog's turning because we've got our marketing operating and working. Inquiries are coming in. We've got our sales team engaging with those inquiries. And what you would have noticed on Joe's machine is that the red cog interacts and passes on the inquiry to the green cog so that the sales team can engage. There's one cog missing. And that is now that when we have signed a deal with our clients and customers, we've got to deliver on our promise. I sign a deal with you, Saskia. I am sitting in the United States or the United Kingdom, wherever I may be. How do you implement and help meet my expectations? Having had a, a detailed project implementation um, plan with our team, um, I ensure and, and the team together that we get through all the steps within the specific deadlines, but through lots of communication with our clients. So you along just the way. said something so important, so important. You said having a detailed project management plan. Yes. But that was part of your selling system. Yes. So in effect, you set up all my expectations around how you would service me in the process of selling before we did a deal together. Yes. And what does that do? Does that remove any misunderstandings and expectation gaps? Does it normally then secure the deal? Yes. And also, you know, they get a good um, rapport with us during that time as well, because it's not a quick, it's not a quick um, exercise. So it, it's relationship building as well. So. I would imagine that that relationship building is especially important. Mm -hmm. Given the fact that we're in South Africa, which in the view of the rest of the developed economies, the United States, Europe, the United Kingdom, is simply a place to go for a holiday. We're not taking that seriously from a business perspective. How do you bridge the cultural dimension, or rather the misconception that many people in the United Kingdom or the United States or Europe, from a business to business point of view, hold towards our brand as South Africa? What do you do to make that right? I think um, in our favor, um, our, our employees or South Africans in general are so, and I know we've been using this a lot in KZN lately, we're so resilient. <laughs> um, and um, they love our accent. Um, and we're just hard workers. You know, and, and with our high unemployment, everybody's hungry for work. So, um, for example, we've just been asked to do a recruitment campaign in the US because they're battling to find agents. So we're going to be interviewing them from South Africa, but to work in America. Um, so they, they love that as well, that, that when we do get staff or they give us a project to do, we, 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 can, we can turn it around quickly because we can get the employees quickly and those employees are hungry. To what extent can you build trust in the sales and delivery process, the operational process, mm -hmm. with clients that sit in the US through screens? Um, a lot of it is through um, a referral business. Um, I do have a network of people overseas as well, which does help having people on the ground. Um, and then just over time, that rapport. And, and I think one thing as well, relationships 
building does take time, but I sit in on all those client meetings with the, with the managers. Um, and then obviously it's at night because of the time zone difference. But the client really appreciates that as well. Mm -hmm. And then you get to know them to just the little, you know, take the time, you know, my one client, her daughter got married, please send me photos, you know, just doing those little added extra personal bits as well mm -hmm. um, does help. So Sunshine, Saskia said something really important here, mm -hmm. that the second customer always comes from performing and doing well by the first customer. Absolutely. Every client that we've acquired has been a referral from another client. Um, your work will speak to your ability. And if you've had a good experience with the client and they feel like you know them a little bit more personal, care about their dogs or, you know, but you're just aware of their life because at the end of the day, we're humans. And I think when you attach a bit of that humanness into business, you develop trust much easier than when I just come in and go, we make 20 million a year. These are our clients. This is what we do. We all can do that. There's so many advertising agencies or marketing agencies that can do that. It's that extra attention you pay. Did you hear me in that moment when I said, I've got a little challenge, but yeah. I've got a deadline? You know, so, it's being so, that aware. So really what you, what you look for, if you've done a good job for a client, is you look for a testimonial, you look for a reference. How do you ask for one? It's really important to get over the awkwardness of asking clients for a testimonial. The, the moment you have a testimonial from someone as big as SAB, for example, who I used to service, it automatically means that industry will trust you because they're such a big player in the game, right? But sorry, is that so? Because let's say I'm Heineken. Mm -hmm. Am I now worried that you that you've got SAB, will SAB let you work with me? How does it work at the top tier of the big four in every sector in every industry? So I'll, um, I'll use alcohol as a great example because I service three out of the four clients. And what you need to be clear about in your sales process or once you've acquired that client is the type of business you want to do. If you want me to be exclusive to you, this is what I would like. And as a business, you have to stand your ground. Sorry, what do you mean this is what I would like? Are you saying I want a five-year year. Five contract exclusive in the area of ABC Absolutely. with a minimum of X amount of projects on an annual basis? And I say this because when we started, we made the mistake of trying to be loyal to the one who gave us business. But what it meant is that we locked ourselves out of the other competitors and our business was much slower. And we didn't have an exclusive contract with that client. We were just being grateful for getting the business. Can you build loyalty in a very big corporate client where in big corporate environments, there's a lot of churn and change of people and positions? Absolutely. I've found that speaking, for example, to procurement, and getting them to understand the type of service we provide, how our business operates, what we've delivered before, almost harassing them with my profile. This is what we do, this is what we've done. Keeping those guys, they don't change as frequently as the marketing managers, the brand managers who grow in the business a year, two years, right? So as much as you'll have a client for many years, say Standard Bank, it will be a different manager every time you engage with that client or as the business grows. So if you have someone or procurement to understand, they're the guys who decides who the contract is going to. Obviously guided, guided by the brand teams, they give you the job based on your ability, your size, have they done it before? You know, is this not a scam, for example? So you find clients who will try you once off because they've seen you service your competitor. And that's how we've been able to service SAB, Diageo and Distel. Each of them have nuances in how they want to work with us. So if we work, for example, on wines with one client, we can't do it with the other client. Naeem, it's very different in your industry, isn't it? Because how do you get measured operationally? What do you need to deliver operationally in order to firstly make money in a very, very competitive environment, in one that's fraught with all sorts of risk and issues, the fact that you're transporting, the fact that you're on the roads, the fact that you've got so many moving parts. 
to the delivery of your service? What do you need to do operationally to make sure that any contract you sign, you can deliver on consistently so that you can renew the contract again and again and again? So operationally, obviously, on-time delivery is very important in our industry. And also cargo, the integrity of the cargo that we transport, because every customer thinks that they are putting their cargo on our vehicle, bubble wrap and in a soft cloud of an environment. However, we are traveling on South African roads with potholes and the integrity of the cargo is very important to our clients. And operationally, while we are looking at from a marketing perspective, what we do right from our customer, operationally, it's important for us to know where we've gone wrong so that we can rectify and provide a better experience to our customers where there is a service failure. Yeah, but you said something so interesting there, and I hope everyone heard it. And that is that when you deliver your service, the process of operations, the client inquired, the client was won by sales, has become a customer. In servicing that customer, the word you used was an operational indicator. It's important, if I understand correctly, to make sure that the client knows how to measure the quality of service that you have provided. And you need to educate the client in terms of what they need to look out for to find those indicators and make sure that it worked. For example, on-time delivery. For example, the integrity of the stock that's been transported. Do you use other indicators as well around driver safety and security? We do use driver safety. We, use, we do use security as well for for our operational requirements. We, there are various indicators that we do use. And the important thing for us is the education of our customers. If I can just go back to the integrity of the cargo. So making it clear to our customers to package their cargo optimally to, to withstand the, the road. So those are the things that we do. We make sure that our customers are also educated on what our operational indicators are. Yeah, it becomes interesting because there's ongoing business there. Robin, in your world, once you have given me a set of teeth or a smile that makes me look 16 again, <laughs> how do you leverage that to get everyone else I know to have the same service that I've enjoyed from you? Well, um, Pablo, so. First of all, we build um, trust with our patients, and that's very important to us because they reward us with five-star re uh, reviews on Google. And it's not about uh, the amount of stars that they give us. It's the testimonials that they, that they write um, about us, which is very important. And also, we provide an experience, a positive experience. It's not a negative, painful experience. And it's not all about the amount of time that the patient um, um, is in the dental chair. That, that's not the most important part. The most important part is the entire experience, how we treat them, how we understand their needs, how we empathize with them, how we understand um, the emotional impact the, uh, of a new smile or, or the existing smile. And so it becomes a place where not only they are driven back into our business, but they come with all their friends and family because the experience has has left them with a with something positive that that uh, you know would drive them to speak about us and to refer us and you know not so, only so listen, word of mouth. But you've just hit on something so important over here. I've always had this big debate right across business, that a brand is built by your operations. It's not built Correct. by marketing. It's not built by sales. Because Correct. operations is what delivers on the promise, and operations is what creates the experience that makes the customer want to use you again and again and again. So when you talk about that experience, does that experience begin 
once I've agreed for service from you, does it begin with how I visit your dental practice? Does it begin with how I'm received at the counter by the reception? Does it begin with the seating? Does it begin with how I am placed in the dental chair? How do you map out the full operational activity to create an experience? Well, as you pointed out, there's a lot of players um, that are involved, a lot of people that are involved to ensure that experience is the same every time you visit and for everyone else, and it's an ongoing. So we have, you know, processes in place that we've written um, because it's a repeatable um, um, and process that everybody needs to understand. So it's about educating the staff. We've even made them write their own, you know, standard operating procedures so that they buy into it and they understand. Um, and, and we put them through the experience themselves. And so that every, every process that is put in place is, is, is easy to follow. And, um, you know, basically everybody upholds the same experience. Exactly. Right it's, re it's repeatable. Practice. It's repeatable, repeatable. It's predictable. It's consistent. Sorry. And ladies and gentlemen, what's so important about that is that it keeps you out of the engine room of your business. But before we go there, I want to go back to Joe, because now we've understood how to generate our leads through a marketing system, how to convert our leads through a sales system, and how to fulfill our service promises and deliver what we promised through an operational system. Joe, what color are we going to use for the final cog that will hopefully now get our propeller turning? Pablo, I think we need a, a color that will support marketing and sales, a stable color, a supporting color, and that will also um, be there for them. And I think the white color, as in the color wheel, is a very good example of a supporting color and the base color. So we can go ahead and put this color on. Let's do it. Let's do it. And let's see if we can get the engine of our business turning. Because if it all hangs together and integrates well, it should get the propeller turning. And folks, remember what the propeller is. It is a reliable, predictable business. One that brings in leads consistently through marketing. One that converts customers consistently through sales and most importantly, one that helps us fulfill our promises consistently and reliably through ops. Switch on the engine, Joe. Let's see what happens. Let's see. Oh, thank heavens. There we go. Folks, we're in business. It's working. I'm glad. <laughs> it's working. Everyone can go home now. That's how easy it is to build a business that can operate, hopefully, largely without you. I want to move on to some of the questions that have come through in our time together. And there are a couple of questions from different parts of the country. Let me see which one we're going to start with. Ah, from George. George, you in KZN. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. <laughs> Let me see the question. Right. Saskia, you're going to have to help me answer this question. George is asking, in an environment where you've lost your business because of the rights, where you've had to suffer and withstand COVID. Is it worth resetting and rebuilding like we have been arguing today? I think if you'd asked me 24 hours after the unrest, I would I absolutely no. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you digest everything and um, go through the process. And, and absolutely, um, we had our offshore agents working in four days as soon as they were able to travel again. Um, they were working, and uh, the rest of our staff were work, working shortly afterwards. So, but, yes. but why do it? Why do it? What's, what's to say that this won't happen again? Because, A, there's so many role players, um, you know, that, that are reliant on the business. So the staff, you know, to, you know, to tell 200 staff that, you know, we're not working anymore, um, that, that pulls, you were talking about head, heart, and hands, and, and, and that pulled on my heart a lot. Um, a lot of our staff have been with us for many years. Um, so it's the staff, our clients, you know, you want to carry on delivering a service. Our clients were amazingly supportive and patient throughout the process. And then our suppliers were, came together and, and, and it's so, so important to have 
a good long-term relationship with your suppliers because in times of need, everyone came together and also just worked in those, with those three cogs as well. Yeah, so George, you know what? I, it's, it's, it is about head, heart and hands. In some cases, it might be out of necessity. I think whatever the situation is that you have faced, what's important for all of us to know is this, that the crises we faced in KZN are the first of many crises that will continue for the rest of all our lives today. At the same time that we had rights in KZN, there were rights in Lebanon, there were rights in France. At the same time, there were rights in KZN. There were fires raging across the west coast of the United States in Oregon. Greece and Turkey were literally burning down. Siberia, the place that you get sent to if you don't listen to whoever, because it's all snowy and icy, was on fire. At the same time that riots were happening in KZN, there were torrential rains that killed numerous people in West Germany that flooded parts of China, robbing people of their homes and businesses too. The fact of the matter is that we need to learn how to build our businesses in a world of uncertainty and in crisis. And in all cases when there is a crisis, some will have the resilience to persist and move beyond it, and many won't. And the real opportunity for you to build back is that if you do, you will build back smarter, you will build back more solidly, and you'll build back in a market that has far fewer competitors. There's a question from Gladys out of Gauteng. If you rebuild your business, developing your marketing and sales and operational systems is one thing, but how do you get the right people in your team to run them? Naima, you work with drivers, and drivers are fundamental to the success of your operation. What is the process you go through to find the right people to do the right thing at the right time? So Pablo, I come from an HR background, and your recruitment process is crucial. It's the same like a sales process. You have to find the right candidate, and they have to match the job that you have. So. Our recruitment process is lengthy, especially for our drivers. We make sure that we have people who are willing to work, people who are there looking for a driver's job, not just looking for a job. So that's, like I said, similar to your, your sales and marketing. Your recruitment process is similar because you have to know what this person expects from your organization. And you have to be able to provide these benefits to the employees. Yeah. So those are things that, that is very important in your recruitment process is that you listen to what people are expecting and what you are offering as a company. You know what, I think one of the most crucial elements of recruiting, I think recruiting is without a doubt one of the hardest parts of business. Mm -hmm. Every time I get a resume or a CV and I read the bullet points on the skills of the person and their attributes and what they can bring to the table, I, you would think that this individual could build the base station on Mars on their own. And I think that recruitment is massively improved if you know why you're employing someone and how do you know to answer that question. Well, if you're employing them to help you in marketing and you understand how to market your business, you can ask them questions around the activities that make up marketing or operations or whatever the case may be. There's a great question out of uh, Cape Town, Candice. How are you using social media to market your business? And is it a viable tool? <laughs> Sunshine, uh, you and I are going to have a big fight over social media. You know my big problem with it? Yes. It's become littered, littered. There are so few social media platforms. You've got Facebook. Instagram, really the two big ones mm -hmm. that are owned by the same company. It's a listed company. Unless you pay to play, mm -hmm. you don't stand a chance. Mm -hmm. You've got LinkedIn, part of Microsoft, a listed company. 
unless you pay to play. <laughs> you don't stand a chance. And I can go on and on. Google no differently. Absolutely. So if you've got a limited budget, how do you firstly evaluate whether you should use social media? Absolutely. And then how do you test it? I think you, you have to look at who you're trying to reach. If you're trying to tap into a new market that your business previously hasn't tapped into, and we'll use the soccer example again, you've always sold in store, and now you're trying to reach out to schools because you realize that's a new target or a new space that you can play in. What I, <laughs> what I say to people is social media is cheaper than your websites. It's cheaper to actually spend on social media than to pay 30000 when you're a business that's starting off. Social media is very specific in a sense that, like I mentioned before, you can target the customer, the area, their likes, their world. You can speak to a specific demographic. That's the power of social media. I agree with you. It's very littered. There's a lot of people selling us a lot of things. But when it's used for a business, it's one of the most effective tools because even if you have 50 bucks, to promote that picture that you've taken of your new machine that targeted to the right people, CEOs in, in Saskia space or in, in uh, Robin's space, right? You want to speak to those guys. You can speak to them directly and miss out the riffraff. You don't have to speak to everyone. So you've just said something really important here. Success in social media is directly proportional. Remember at school. Directly proportional. I love Absolutely. that symbol. It was half a. It was half the infinity symbol. Yes. Directly proportional to the extent that you understand who your customer is and how they behave. Absolutely. My mother's on Facebook. We never bump into each other on Facebook. Thank heavens. Imagine <laughs> what she would say. <laughs> Absolutely. But she has a community of friends that they travel together and they visit um, Catholic sites and, and they engage. They have this whole little world that's got nothing to do with me. And that's the power of social media. You can create your own tribes. You can create your own si silos of customers and how you speak to them. It's how you use the tool to work for you. I, get, I, I think a lot of businesses are scared by the tools themselves. They list it, they this, they that. No, what can the tool do for me? If I'm selling a table, I can put it online, put a price to it, sell it, use one of these partners to deliver, and I've done it, and it's cost me zero rands. There we go. McDonald's Wi-Fi <laughs> and the coffee, and it's still cheaper than building a website. It is indeed. Absolutely. One more question. Uh, this comes from Johan in Gauteng. Robin, I'm going to ask you to address this. Johan asks a very good question. In the professional services space where your skill is important in delivering a service, how can you scale and grow your business beyond you? Well, in... In our professional environment, and I think in, in many professional environments, I think that when you go to university and you get your degree, I don't think that they teach you how to actually run your business effectively. So, for example, you know, um, in, in, in a doctor or a plastic surgeon or a lawyer, they learn their, their, their skill on how to deliver what they would like to deliver, but they, they have no idea um, or, or training on how to run a business. And that's the most important part of it, how to identify who your customer is, how to market to them, what systems to put in place, you know, how to track whether you are um, growing or not. And, and that, that is key. So, like, for example, um, what we are doing, um, in order for, for our, um, in our industry to be able to afford all the digitization that is dentistry of the future, you're not going to be able to often find a, a single um, standalone one man uh, practice in the professional environment. You're going to have to have groups of multi specialties and then use one resource, which is what, what we're busy doing. We, we, we're putting all of these um, systems in place so that we can provide other um, similar type uh, professions with the business background that they need so that they can continue uh, doing what they love and what they're passionate yeah. about with, be it, you know, a dentist, be it uh, a, an ophthalmic surgeon or whatever. They, they do what they're trained to do and what they love and they leave the business part of it 
to somebody who has the know-how that can support them and allow them to scale without, um, you know, with, with easily, let me put it to Excellent. you that way, with, with all the systems that are in place that allow you to scale and so that all the, all the elements are predictable and repeatable. It's a great answer, Johan. So, so some really interesting insights there. In a world that has shrunk because of digitization, expertise and deep expertise is what can help set you apart. But always when dealing with clients and customers, that very deep and increasingly narrowing expertise sits within an ecosystem of services. And it's important then, if I hear what Robin has said, to position yourself within the right environment per se. Folks, we are moving towards closing. We will try and address some further questions through other forums. You will again be all receiving an email with some of the summary points and contact details of my fantastic panel. I'm sure you'll all agree. I can hear you all applauding right around the country, despite the fact that it's coming through uh, digital, um, because I can feel it telepathically. So thank you for that, and thank you for the warm reception you've given them. There will also be an invitation for you to join us at the next SME Matters event, Reignite, where we will be talking to what you need to do that with the right mindset, in a reset business that makes you relevant for the future, rebuilt through the help of my panel and Joe, to focus on how to ignite that business and get it to where you want to get it to in the future ahead. Thank you for not spending time with us, but investing the time with us. I hope you've gotten a good return from today. And I hope to see you all at the next event where we will take the reset business that's been rebuilt to race ahead and build value for ourselves, our teams, our customers, our suppliers, and through that, for South Africa in a very, very tough economy. Thank you all again. My last point to leave you with, if you don't do it for your business, and therefore yourself, nobody else will. You can also watch a recording of this discussion on YouTube. And again, thank you, my panel. Thank you so much for being part of this. Joe, thank you for giving up time to be here. If you found value in it on YouTube, please share it with other business owners out there. Businesses exist in an ecosystem. And to the extent that we can get the ecosystem making it happen. We can get our economy making it happen. And at the end of the day, our, for our futures in South Africa, it's all about one thing. It's all about the economy and the opportunity can provide every single one of us. Take care, get at it, and have an entrepreneurial week further. <laughs>